So let's look at my favorite one that, that displays this. This is uh, Sonnet 14. This is one that gets published quite often, so you might have seen this even in other textbooks, but notice the violence. <laughs> this is a poem about salvation. It's a poem about asking God into your heart, and yet look at the violent terminology. It's great. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you as, but, as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Like I'm so lost that I need to kind of be destroyed in order to be remade new again. I, like a usurped town, to another do. Someone else has control of me. Labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. I'm trying, but I can't escape this thing that holds so much power over me. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Betrothed, I'm, I'm like I'm married, I'm wed to my sin, to you know, evil, to Satan, to whatever it is that's controlling me. Divorce me, untie me, break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you and thrall me never shall be, th shall be free, nor ever chased, except you ravish me. Again, sort of that erotic terminology, but look at the power of those words that he's feeling so desperate, so lost, so separated from God that he believe he's making the comparison that the only way I can be saved is if you forcefully take me over. Like, I'm seeking you, but I can't reach you. Please come get me and capture my life again. So notice all the violent imagery. We don't usually think of words like batter and break and usurped and, you know, these pretty aggressive words for a loving God. But maybe that's the only way he can make us understand what he's feeling is by using that violent imagery. So pretty powerful stuff. So again, let's notice the paradoxes that come up in some of these that here are opposite things that shouldn't go together, but that's how the point is made. Oh, to vex me. Again, Paradoxes. Oh, to vex me, contraries meet in one. Inconstancy unnaturally hath begot a constant habit. Sort of the only thing constant is change, right? You ever heard that cliche? Oftentimes our habits form from being disorganized. We think, they go, we think it's the other way around, but it's not. That when I would not, I change in vows and in devotion, as humorous in my contrition, as my profane love, and as soon forgot as riddlingly distempered, chaotic, cold and hot, as praying, as mute, as infinite, as none. He's all over the place, right? He's, he's trying to believe all these different things and he can't quite bring it together. I durst not view yet heaven yesterday and today in prayers and flattering speeches I court God. Tomorrow I quake with true fears of his rod. Every day is different. There's chaos in his life. Yesterday, I wasn't even thinking about heaven. Oh, but today, now I'm deep in prayer. Like, he can't, he can't be consistent in his own faith. Might sound similar to some of us sometimes. So my devout fits come and go away like a fantastic ague, which is an illness. Save that here, those are my best days. Here's the paradox. When I shake with fear. So for him, the days where he's most clear in his faith, where he's like, okay, I get it. I know that I need God today, is actually when he's fearful. He calls those his best days. He's like, when I can fully recognize my sinful nature, <laughs> usually those are our worst days, right? When we're at our lowest point, we feel guilt, we feel sadness, we feel all these things that are not positive. And yet he's reached the conclusion that no, those are actually the days when I'm more aware of myself and I know that I'm actually fearing God and connecting to God. It's a, hard, it's a hard paradox to wrap your brain around. And um, again, I know that's not a very comfortable feeling for most of us, but for John Donne, that seemed to be something he believed in quite regularly. Many titles I resign. For me, this is number two. Notice all the different metaphors here. So there's still paradoxes throughout and ironies and all that stuff, but notice some of his other figurative language. 
As do by many titles I resign myself to thee, O God. First I was made by thee and for thee, and when I was decayed, when I was sinning, thy blood bought that, the which before was thine. Notice all the comparisons. I am thy son, made with thyself to shine, and thy servant, whose pains thou still hast repaid, thy sheep, thine image, and till I betrayed myself a temple of thy spirit divine. We're all these things in relationship to God, right? Why doth the devil then usurp me? There's that word, that taking over. Why doth he steal, nay, ravish? That's thy right. So Satan's trying to damage what is God's. Right? He's trying to steal us away from him. Except thou rise and for thine own work fight, but you fight back on my behalf. Oh, I shall soon despair when I do see that thou lovest mankind well, yet wilt not choose me. And Satan hates me, yet is loath to lose me. So think of the ironic twist here. God loves us, right? But he might not accept us if we don't get right with him. Satan hates us. He's trying to destroy us. And yet he's constantly trying to come and be with me. That's the kind of the, you can, you can just imagine that in a physical sense that, can you imagine someone who hates you yet always wants to be around you? And someone who loves you might not be with you, if you because you're not prepared for that. It's a tough thing to swallow and I think that's a, just a profound way to, to conclude that poem. But look at all those other metaphors and how we fit into uh, our relationship with God. Just a couple more. Oh, my black soul. <laughs> These are, the, these are the things Dr. Bryson was talking about where they're not always the most uh, heartening things to think about. Oh, my black soul. So he's talking to his soul. So there's a personification happening here. So another figurative language device, right? Now art thou summoned by sickness, death's herald and champion. Notice all these similes that show up. Thou art like a pilgrim, which abroad hath done treason and durst not turn to whence he has fled. When we become sinful, we can't turn back. We're, we've, we've crossed the border, right? We're in that world now. You, you can't become innocent again, right? Or like a thief, another simile, which till death's doom be read, wisheth himself delivered from prison, but damned and hailed to execution, wisheth that he still might be imprisoned. So again, the idea that, you know, uh, I might be miserable when I'm in prison, but the thought of being executed then makes prison seem not so bad. But there's this turn, and this often happens, that's why I've bolded right there, this turn that happens with six lines to go. This is pretty common in, in uh, sonnets. Yet grace, if thou repent, thou canst not lack. But who shall give thee that uh, grace to begin? O make thyself with holy morning black and red with blushing as thou art with sin. We may be covered in red sin, but red blood is the thing that purifies us. Or wash thee in Christ's blood, which hath this might, that being red, it dyes red souls to white. And we can tell by the end that the word dyes is about color, but we also know in our faith that Christ dying for us fits that line perfectly as well. So while we run and we hide from sin, like we're a pilgrim, a traveler trying to escape, we eventually have to face it and we have to be cleansed. And we must act, even though God completes it, we have to take that first step. If you, Ephesians 2 uh, references some of this. And God shows faithfulness when we confess, and we can't be forgiven otherwise. Check the beginning of 1 John where he talks about um, purifying us that way. So lots of biblical parallels here too. Last one. This is also a very famous one. This shows up in a lot of uh, just standard textbooks that are you know, not Christian based. I mean, I, this was in my high school textbook, so uh, I remember it from back then. The round earth's imagined corners, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise from death, you numberless infinities of souls, and to your scattered bodies go. So he's calling for judgment day. Angels, let's do it. And all whom the flood did and fire shall overthrow, all whom war, dearth, age, agues, illness, tyrannies, despair, law, chance, hath slain, and you 
whose eyes shall behold God and never taste death's woe. So he's essentially calling for the dead to wake up and prepare for God's judgment. Not just sinful people, but all people. Even those that aren't dead yet, we're all, we're all going to have to prepare ourselves. And again, here's this turn, this one final switch. But now he's talking to God. Angels first, now God. But let them sleep, Lord, and me mourn a space. For if above all these my sins abound, tis late to ask abundance of thy grace. He's worried that his own sins might be worse than those of the, of the dead he's talking about. And so he needs a little more time to repent. When we are there, here on this lowly ground, teach me how to repent. For that's as good as thou hadst sealed my pardon with thy blood. So there's the one final paradox for us that the thing God wants from us is something that we actually often don't know how to do. But God simultaneously makes forgiveness and salvation very easy. It's not so hard to repent. But sometimes it is very hard to repent. So it's, that's the contrast for us.